so this no is actually going to be my first time talking about my research. I don't know if you guys can. Okay, cool. Um, so this will be my first time talking about the research that I've started since joining Atlas. Um, and I'll just talk kind of do all the work for me. I'm not going to kind of dive in, but I've been here for about two years now and I started this work uh, about a year ago, a little bit over a year. You, yeah. <laughs> drive me mad. Okay, so I'm going to talk to you about Craniate, uh, which is an informal STEM learning uh, or technically STEAM learning uh, kit and eventually will be a company. Um, and then uh, I'll just talk about kind of the, the sections of this talk. So first I'll start off talking about uh, systemic problems uh, that affect STEM learning uh, and create disparities in the classroom. Uh, kind of what they are, what the measurements are, and the drivers of them, the relationships of all of these really complex issues. Um, and then I'll talk about how Craniate is designed to help address those problems um, and just what we're doing, what the project is, uh, how we're developing it, and where we hope to see it going. And then we have some time. I do have like literally two slides talking about research to market. So this is uh, research, STEM education research that I am hoping to pivot into a business. So I do want to commercialize it. And I feel like there's a lot of that happening at Atlas. So I figured it might be useful uh, to several folks if I touch on that a little bit. So I'll dive in. This is interesting. Okay, <laughs> um, it's fine. Uh, so STEM education uh, is a wicked problem. Hold on, I'm gonna I'm gonna pause one second just to change this around so I'm not like going back and forth since I don't have my notes. Um, give me one sec here. Do do do, and it might mess up uh, the share screen, so I'll fix that. Or do I need to share screen? I don't know. Do I need to share screen? On Zoom? I yes. So. Yeah, yeah. We can okay. see you on screen. That's absolutely fine. Yes. If you make it big, we can see. Yeah. Let's just do that, and that way I don't. I just want to make sure my bases are covered. Okay. Um, <laughs> okay. So STEM education has a wicked problem. Uh, a wicked problem is something that is described as a social or cultural problem that is difficult to solve. A lot of people say they're impossible to solve not a doomerist. I believe we will correct all of the issues because we have the technology minds and people willing to do it. So it's going to happen. Um, but they're characterized particularly by having a complex and interconnected nature. So usually a wicked problem doesn't stand on its own. It's connected to other things like uh, in this case, it actually has some relationship to climate change and things like that. Um, and so STEM wicked problem is the achievement gap. Uh, which is, uh, we see a difference, I'm sorry, let me, <laughs> I'm yeah, like so yeah. used to like not having people see my screen, <laughs> uh, which is a disparity that we see in uh, performance on standardized tests and grades, uh, particularly in STEM subjects, so that's science, um, uh, physics kinds of classes, uh, ge geology, mathematics, etc. Um, and I really like this quote uh, because I think it really, uh, captures the scale of this problem, which is that no matter what we're measuring, if it's grades, tests, attendance, dis discipline referrals, etc., cetera, um, white upper middle class English speaking America, uh, students that differ from them are the most vulnerable to being misserved by our nation's schools. And so I'll talk a little bit about what these problems is, are, how they get characterized, um, and then what people are doing to, affect, to change that. Um, so this is probably the most succinct uh, representation of the problem that I've seen in a single graph. So I'll walk you through it. So we're looking at academic achievement as a function of socioeconomic status. Socioeconomic status generally is used, in, like colloquially is used to infer income, but it also means education, employment, um, and sometimes can include things like what kind of household items you have. Uh, so it basically is telling you like how easy is it for you to access things in this largely capitalistic structure that we live in. Um, and so they have a scaling, um, I can't remember what this X axis scaling is, but they are scaling for uh, the lower scores mean that it's more poor at disadvantage. So there's a sing single parent uh, household with uh, no, no uh, college education, et cetera, uh, to affluent and advantage. So high income, 
uh, educated parents, uh, two-parent household, et cetera. On the y-axis, we have um, an average achievement. Uh, so if the achievement is zero, this means that the student is performing at the expectations for their grade level. Um, and if it is, uh, so this goes by years. So here, these are students that are performing a year above their grade level, two years, three years, or four years, et cetera. Um, and so you could see that there's an almost linear trend. Uh, it's generous. <laughs> there's a trend toward <laughs> uh, where uh, poor or disadvantaged students have a very large tendency of underperforming uh, relative to their grade. If we break this out and combine uh, race and ethnicities along the scale, we start to see that there's really distinct clustering um, where white students are among the highest performing students, Hispanic students are starting to drop below that line, and Black students are at the lowest level. Um, so we also know that there, this isn't the only issue um, or it isn't the only demographic that are affected. Is, it's not just race and uh, ethnicity. There's a lot of other things that factor into it too. Um, and a lot of this is driven, this disparity that we see is largely driven by funding that comes to the different schools. Um, and so when we're talking about public schools in particular, public schools and the money that they're, they get annually reliably is driven by taxes. And so if you are in a low income area, you're, you have uh, high poverty, you're going to have lower income that's coming in. If you have a low poverty district, so you have more schools that are, are uh, affluent, like Boulder, than you do uh, have um, uh, not so affluent schools, then they're going to have higher um, tax money uh, annually to come in to help support them. Um, and then if we break this out across races again, we start to see that um, uh, on the left hand side, we're seeing non white schools that have low high poverty and then low poverty and uh, white schools, predominantly white schools that have high poverty and low poverty. So even uh, just looking at income, there's this other factor of uh, racial disparity that comes up as well. Um, so typically non-white districts receive less than uh, white districts in 21 of those instances. So it's quite prevalent. Um, and then this also leads to issues or could, uh, along with this are issues with enrollment. Um, so schools in, that are non-white with high poverty are really, really big. They have a lot of student enrollment, whereas uh, white schools in high poverty areas, so a similar kind of income, they have much smaller uh, enrollment. So that allows you to have a little bit higher student-to-teacher ratio and improve your education practices. Um, so the two takeaways here are that low-income public school districts generally get uh, less money if they are in high poverty, and it gets compounded if it's also a non-white uh, school district. Um, and the same thing, uh, we also see that high-poverty schools are larger, um, especially if they're non-white. So let's talk about what this leads to um, and how this is, why this is a wicked problem. So we're going to focus on school district financial constraint. So if you have a uh, low income uh, due to low taxes, for example, um, you're going to see a lot of effects come out of this. So one of the things we'll see are having fewer resources. This is for students of all identities, right? We're talking about a district. We're talking about a school. We're not talking about a specific classroom or a specific group of students. Um, so all of these affect um, all of the students equally. Uh, so this also means that you have low hiring. You're not able to hire maybe as high quality teachers. They're going to go to where there's better pay. Uh, these schools generally have low income uh, or, or low uh, salaries. Uh, this leads to uh, having poor teachers or uh, low teacher quality and high turnover rate, which is also a common issue. You're going to have inaccurate assessments of students, of their performance. Uh, if you have larger classrooms, it's harder for teachers to have an idea of what every single student is doing and what they need and then meet those needs. We also have harsher disciplinary measures because it's harder to have a, an, an interpersonal relationship with these students. It's much easier to use these kind of harsh enforcements to try to get um, gross behavior to be uh, generally amenable. Um, and then this leads to implicit bias uh, about the students and about the teachers. So, um, and I can tell you from experience <laughs> going to a title with school, I went to like the bad school, even though we had uh, now, you know, we've graduated to become Olympic athletes, Broadway performers, uh, governors of states, doesn't really matter if that school is still labeled a bad school, right? 
Um, so you have this implicit bias about the area. And so all of this leads back to um, affecting financial constraint uh, because stereotypes about the school district will develop, affluent people will move away so they can get their kids a better education. Uh, charter schools are is a really complex and controversial uh, thing where charter schools tend to form in these lower income areas or these hybrid areas like on the cusp of being low income and they spend away tax money. Um, so the public schools don't get this continued support. Um, and then alumni, uh, as the students are going through this in a pretty harsh environment, they develop these negative associations to school and they move away from education. Mm -hmm. And so in these areas where you might have a lot of diversity in the student body, you don't end up having those students go back to becoming teachers, which leads to less representation, which leads to more uh, 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 segregation between the students and the teachers. Um, and then, of course, what affects financial uh, constraints is more than just taxes. There's lots of things that lead into why you have certain districts that have less money than others. There's gerrymandering, which will siphon, uh, which will reshape the, the uh, voting population away from uh, certain demographics, which then uh, puts a chokehold on how money can flow through the state into these districts. Um, you have disruptions from police abuse, right? So there's this high tendency of males between 17 and 25 going to jail. And that disrupts the home you don't have uh it means and a lot of times it means you remove fathers from the home that affects your income in the home that affects your tax rate right? <laughs> and then you have redlining that although redlining is tapering out we're still seeing the long-lasting effects where you don't see a lot of homeowners in that area so you don't have the people who are generally giving the most taxes also having the largest uh, voting influence so it's this wicked problem right you see all these different compa components that are leading in and ultimately driving these disparities that i showed before so very daunting <laughs> very scary very overwhelming but there's uh plenty of stuff that uh can be done to help it um Actually, I'm actually, it's sustaining. It's actually, it's increasing slowly. Uh, but this gap that we're seeing between the socioeconomic divide is persistent. It's persistent across grades. It increases, it starts at about um, first or second grade, and you start to see it expand until about eighth grade, and it pretty much levels off and stays the same. Uh, but if we look over the years from 1950 uh, to 2001, if we're looking at where um, students are born. Oh, this is a different graph, sorry. Um, there is there is an increase in that disparity. So if we look at the extremes of that bell curve, that basically the curve is just getting broader and broader and broader, right? Um, and so it's not just race, uh, it's not just ethnicities. This, we see this across gender as well. Um, so if we're looking at a binary gender, uh, binary spectrum, we have males and females. Uh, and so the lower uh, the number, uh, or sorry, the lower the plot, the more likely it is to favor females, and the higher the plot, the more likely the scoring is to favor males, meaning that if we look at these standardized tests, we generally see that male students do better in mathematical testing, and female students do better in English testing. Um, and so the inverse is true, right? This means that male students generally perform poor, poorer on English assessments, and female students generally perform poor, poorer on math students. And this all comes back to uh, the disparities, the social disparities that I talk about, because they don't fall through and affect students uh, evenly. It affects uh, genders as well, not just uh, races and ages. This is, uh, yeah. And then um, also when we think about ability, right? Um, so here we're seeing basically trends for a number of different um, uh, disabilities. Um, so we see that there are impacts and, and learning gaps across uh, um, neurodiverse um, identities as well, physically diverse identities. Uh, so if we're looking at the top, we're seeing academically gifted in reading and academically gifted in So these are like our standout um, able-bodied students. Uh, and then general education is kind of like our average students and able-bodied and disabled together. And then once you start to break out uh, the different disabilities, we see that they are all underperforming, right? Um, from grade three all the way up to grade seven. So again, this is something that is broadly affecting a lot of different identities um, and a lot of different minoritized students. Um, one last point is that if we add in disabled students onto this graph, assuming that uh, they are at an average socioeconomic status, 
they perform about three years behind their able-bodied students, right? Um, and this is true for a lot of different um, disabilities. I know it's a really disabled, is kind of a, a huge umbrella, um, but in general, we're seeing disabled students are underperforming as well. So um, once these students are behind, they do not catch up. So these disparities tend to take place in uh, elementary school or so. Um, and once they go on, really once they get to middle school, it's kind of cemented in place. There's not a lot of um, uh, 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 interventions that happen in high school that can correct this. And so once they start to fall behind, they start to have a lot of psychological effects from being behind as well. Um, and so the only thing that they, uh, they cannot catch up without intervention. And so here's where craniate comes in and, and just active, active work in general. How can we create these interventions that help alleviate these problems in the kids? We're not trying to solve the whole wicked problem, just trying to solve a symptom of it. <laughs> uh, okay, so effective interventions. Uh, this is where STEM education comes in. I'm gonna take this time to introduce you to a couple of terms. I'm sure you guys know a few of them, but everything that I'm talking about and researching has to do with these terms. So I just want you all to be familiar and I will find them again and again. I just wanna have them all together in one place. Um, so first is socioeconomic status or SES. Um, these are factors that lead to social standing or class and they typically depend on, as I stated before, um, education of the child, education of the parents, income, um, employment, and in some studies, because it's wildly variable and uh, socioeconomic work is huge, huge, huge field, some people include household items, like what they have access to, if they have uh, computers, if they have TVs, um, and environmental factors. Um, and this is where like environmental racism comes into play. So if they're living in a place like near Cali in Louisiana, they're going to have a harder time learning because they're going to have to spend a lot of energy dealing with uh, physiological impacts of where they're physically living. Or if they're living in a food desert, same thing. Um, so all of these things kind of affect your status. Um, and then uh, these drive other uh, systemic social problems, as we all know. Um, and then one main measure that I'll be talking about in abundance for my research is STEM attitudes, and it's exactly what it sounds like, <laughs> your attitude towards STEM, what you think of it, what you think of people in that career. Uh, specifically, it's how these students feel about uh, STEM subjects, um, the careers, and the people that are pursuing those careers. STEM identity, which is another huge, these are all like gigantic broad terms. <laughs> um, so there's a lot of nuance and, and kind of uh, a, a great amount of skill to really work these out. Um, but STEM identity is a student's ability um, or tendency to see themselves or aspects of themselves in a, a STEM professional, right? So seeing a scientist or seeing an engineer and going, oh yeah, that person's a lot like me. I can see myself doing that job. I can understand how they're doing, someone like me doing that job. Um, and then the last one, which is probably the hardest one to understand, um, is STEM ability beliefs or STEM self-efficacy. And I know that ability beliefs and self-efficacy are kind of different, but they tend to measure out the same. Um, so I'm gonna be talking about them almost as if they are synonymous for the purposes of this talk. Um, and this basically refers to uh, your self-perception that um, you can do something uh, and you can change how uh, your, you could change your ability and you can grow, um, or that confidence that you can uh, uh, accomplish some task. That's really what self-efficacy is, uh, versus having a fixed trait that's beyond their control. So having worked with a lot <laughs> of K-12 students, the number of times I've met a student that just goes, I'm just bad at math is an example of STEM ability beliefs or lack of STEM ability beliefs where they just treat it like this is just something that I'm inherently bad at. I don't have control over it. It might as well be a genetic trait, right? <laughs> so getting them to think that it's something different, that it's something that they can change, that it's something they can explore is really huge in trying to get students to think about um, the subjects that they're learning differently and mm -hmm. what they're able to do in the classroom. Any questions so far? So all right, so I want to create learning tools that inform STEM abilities and self-efficacy. So basically help students understand that their abilities in STEM subjects and, or their performance in school can change and they have the agency to do it. Um, and this is really key. There's, oh my gosh, so many studies. I put one here, but there's so many studies that show that this is a really great predictor 
of uh, whether or not a student will consider following a car uh, career in STEM. Um, uh, we also will develop tools that will help uh, develop STEM identity. Uh, this really focuses on feelings, nurturing feelings of belonging. And for that, we need to start to think about things like cultural competence. What do we know about the cultures that we're teaching to, that we're working with? Um, and inclusion, how do we get those voices that are usually excluded from this dialogue into the dialogue so that the students understand that they can see themselves in these roles and these career developments. Uh, this also ties into representation, visual representation um, in particular. Um, and so here we wanna see, highlight a lot of diversity in STEM careers. This isn't just who is doing STEM, but what those careers are. A lot, a lot, a lot of students, especially in disadvantaged areas, have this tendency of thinking I can become a doctor, I can become a vet, I can uh, become like a surgeon, but they don't really think about all of the new things like biomechanics and biophysics. That's not really something that comes up for them. So having an understanding of what they can do will actually, is another form of, of uh, representation. And then a big thing that's coming up, I am so, so exhausted by hearing about scientific authenticity. My goodness, it's huge in STEM. It's huge in uh, the national uh, standards of science um, that they want to have not just teach students, oh, here's the scientific method, but here's how a scientist actually goes about figuring out something that they know. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about some examples of what that looks like when I talk about craniate. And then all of this together is aimed to help improve STEM attitudes, right? We want to have students who are thinking about science, technology, engineering, and math as fun and accessible and applicable to their lives, especially because we think about the correlation of these low socioeconomic students and environmental racism. They're going to be the ones that are most gravely impacted by climate change, et cetera. So they're the ones that are really, we really need to call on them and, and corral them into the conversation of how we correct the errors that we've been making as a, as a society. Um, and so these predict success, um, having positive STEM attitudes, predict success in STEM subjects and persistence in higher education all the way up through PhD. So if they have a strong STEM attitude, middle school, high school, it will persist all the way to like, getting their final degrees, more likely to anyway. Um, and so I'm building this for nine to 13 year old students. So really focusing on middle school with a little bit of buffer around it. Um, and part of the reason is because um, these uh, achievement gaps basically grow up until middle school and then they stay constant. So here's something where something is getting cemented. This is our last chance to make any sort of changes that we can in how these students are thinking about themselves and their role in STEM. Um, and so we want to get that. Uh, so I'm trying to tackle them before they get to high school where all of this is really like the social structure is really cemented and very, very hard to change. All right, so here's what I'm doing. Here's Craniate. I figured um, out of a lot of conversation, this has been a long time coming. I think I had my first idea for Craniate about six years ago um, and then it's blossomed into this whole um, package. So it has a two part design I'm looking at uh, the use of visual storytelling, particularly comics, to see how this affects uh, STEAM identity. And because it includes visual storytelling, it now goes from STEM, uh, science, technology, engineering, and math, to also including art. So I'm going to be using STEAM intentionally uh, from here on out because art is a really huge component of all of this. And uh, I call it a gateway drug, right? It's what we want to use to help allure students to think about things a little bit differently. Um, and then through this visual uh, storytelling, it's also interactive. We're hoping to improve um, ability beliefs and self-efficacy by seeing students who are in similar situations, similar uh, communities, doing similar things as they are, also participating in STEAM uh, problem solving um, and looking at how their personal interests are actually STEAM interests. Um, and then the second part is um, a kit or an experiment kit uh, called ModCap. Um, and this is um, active learning, which is, again, one of these like stanchions in STEM education, that active learning where you're engaged, you're not just listening, you're participating, you're building something, uh, you're making something, you're solving problems, that this is really what boosts students' understanding of STEM concepts um, and their abilities. So we're doing um, authentic, scientifically authentic, project-based experiments. 
um, really trying to get students to go, oh, I can do this. I can think about this. I didn't realize that this was engineering. I love this, right? Um, so in, and in that role, uh, start to improve self-efficacy. Um, and then through examples that are, again, based on their personal experience, drawn off of their life experiences, they start to develop a STEAM identity just in the process of seeing how what they're doing applies to their world. Um, and so I want to take these two tools and see how this effect affects STEAM attitudes as well as comprehension. I'm not really going to talk about comprehension here. I'm really going to focus on these kind of high level themes. All right, so coming back, uh, so we we're talking about the systemic problem of the achievement gap um, and STEM learning disparities and how they persist and what drives them. Um, and now I started to introduce Carnegie, but let's really dig down and see how these are going to, like what the, what the kit actually is and how the designs are built to address these problems specifically. Um, so there's a lot to craniate that's different from what other people are doing. Uh, there's very few people or very few studies uh, in STEM education where the researchers are designing the tool themselves. A lot of times they'll find like a Lego kit or uh, kits that are already existing and then bring them to the students and then see how they work. But that doesn't really uh, allow them to see like, okay, what if we change this thing? How do we actually get in and change the dials? So this is uh, Craniate's primary novelty. Um, in the STEM education world, along, there's a couple other things too. Um, and the design for um, the inspiration design uh, comes from uh, a couple of things, primarily uh, the experience of the creators. So I'm gonna introduce my team in a bit. We're very diverse and intentionally selected to be diverse. So we have this big per broad perspective among all of the creators. Um, uh, STEAM outreach work. So I've been doing STEAM outreach for I think it's like 13 years now. It's a long time. <laughs> so I've been in a lot of classrooms in a lot of places across the country. I've been in rural classrooms. I've been in city classrooms. I've been in uh, predominantly black classrooms. I've been in predominantly Latinx classrooms. I've been in autistic classrooms. I've been in every kind of classroom you could possibly imagine <laughs> over these 10 years and talking about um, uh, neuroscience and just, do, just doing general outreach work. Um, and so a lot of this has informed uh, what's known about STEM careers, you know, I'm talking to these students, I'm, I'm, I'm in their world, I'm in their community, which ones do they hear about? What actually gets to these students? Um, and then when I'm talking about uh, interactivity tools, experiments and things, what is attractive and what's effective? What are they kind of innately drawn to? And so I've taken kind of the favorites that I've seen um, students like and turn, to turn them into content that goes into Craniate. And then of course there's research. Um, so just doing the kind of standard canonical primary literature work um, and all of this together is to uh, create cultural competency in the materials that I'm producing by incorporating these minoritized or often silenced experiences and voices into the research. So what does it end up in the papers? Um, and a lot of the uh, STEM educators that I know that are of minoritized backgrounds have a really hard time in STEM education, mostly because their experience isn't really being talked about in this research and they're, what they know works. Uh, for example, uh, word of mouth communication in uh, low income Black and Latinx uh, communities is way more prevalent than going on Instagram or social media or the web to talk about things. But that doesn't show up when, when people are evaluating how students are communicating in these communities, just to give an example. Um, so we really have to think outside the box and think outside of research to get ideas that are actually going to be um, functional in solving these problems. All right, so this is my team. Um, so we have uh, five really amazing people uh, working together, six if you count me. Um, so uh, here we have Harley. Uh, they're the lead illustrator um, and really focusing on the comic design. They do integral work with character design, um, universe building, all of the very tedious things that come with writing a book <laughs> or writing a comic. Uh, they really uh, tackle it with grace and skill. Uh, then there's Arva Syed, who is a, a TAM major, um, and she really has done outstanding work for graphic design. So all of our logos were designed by her. Uh, she also does really incredible work dealing with the layout of the booklets, which you'll see later, and also supports Harley in illustration, like inking and shading and stuff in the comics. Uh, and then we have Chase Gordonier, who I think is in uh, the Zoom room. Um, 
And I call him the experiment engineer. So he's really pretty much almost single-handedly developing um, uh, the prototypes for the mod cap, um, one of which is here. Um, and so just a standout student um, working in, oh crud, I have to remember things, mechanical engineering? <laughs> Let me know if I got that wrong. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, electrical engineering. Um, and so, uh, and also looking at um, STEM education as well. Um, and so we've been really working together to create um, the mod capsule component, the uh, experimental component of this. And then our lucky members, uh, one shown here is Yami and Zhe Ching. Uh, they are CAD developers, and I'll show you what they're doing uh, momentarily. They do really key work. Oh yeah, thanks. <laughs> All right, uh, so this is our comic. It's called Axon Squad. Um, Arva uh, did a guest cover of this, um, um, uh, did a guest cover for this and has designed our logo. Um, and so this is an interactive comic. You kind of think of it like Highlights Magazine, but with a plot. Um, so there's activities for them to do at least one major activity, and that activity and their performance helps the team solve the problem. So it's not just you're doing things along, you're trying to figure out how to solve the problem that's going on in the story by applying these STEM education skills. Um, and so it takes place in East Brookridge Middle School. Uh, three students shown here go to a, a science museum, and then they sneak off to explore the exhibits, have a chance encounter with two scientists from the future who have traveled back in time, and they're kind of battling uh, scientists. So there's Malice, his name is Ma Guy Malice, like literally bad guy. <laughs> and then there's Gia, who is suspicious of Malice and uh, gets on his uh, spaceship and goes through a wormhole, and then they come back uh, to more or less present day um, uh, Earth. America, US, whatever. Um, so these two students uh, get attacked by, uh, they get sprayed with a nano, nanobot spray, and then they start to develop um, superpowers. So as the students are developing superpowers, the readers are learning about neuroscience, biology, biomechanics, physics, all of the things that have to come into play to realistically create a superpower. So their superpowers are based in science, I actually taught a class at Virginia Tech called the Neuroscience of Superpowers to do research for this. <laughs> I get paid to do it. Um, so all of their developments are actually things that are feasible um, given the technologies that are just developing right now. Um, and so, like I said before, um, they're, gonna, they're going to participate in puzzles that are integral to uh, producing the plot and solving the problem. So they, the reader is actually like the sixth men member, eventually sixth member of the Axon Squad. Um, and so we built this, um, this is, you know, Atlas, so we're gonna do things, uh, we're gonna use all our resources <laughs> and all of the brilliant minds and different tools that are around. Um, and so the first thing that we do really is extensive community interviews. We have talked to everyone, <laughs> every type of person in order to get a realistic idea of what each of these characters is like, what their home life is like, what their parents do, um, who their parents hang out with, who their parents let them hang out with as kids, how strict they are, all sorts of things. Um, and then we also do extensive scientific interviews. I've interviewed, uh, as you'll see in the, the thank you slides, um, I've interviewed uh, nanotechnologists, uh, nanoroboticists, um, all sorts of physicists, other neuroscientists, and I'm constantly asking, what do you think is feasible? Where do you think this will go in the future? How likely do you think this is gonna happen? If you were gonna travel in time, what's the actual way that we would travel in time? <laughs> like, not making things up and flying off of our seats, but just actually really rooting it in science. So we create this fantastical world that's grounded in a reality that stokes the curiosity of the readers. Um, so when we physically design it, we're using CADs. This is what uh, Zhe Cheng and Yami are working on. Uh, so they're developing uh, CAD backgrounds in Blender. Um, and so we work to, oops, I did this backwards. <laughs> um, uh, so we have the CAD scene in Blender, uh, and then we use the render camera uh, to actually take a photo of the background, and then we draw our um, tunes on top. And so we're working to create shaders so we have a uniform look throughout the entire um, piece. Um, and so this is just where we are in um, development so far. Um, and then with the mod capsule, uh, this is an authentic experiment kit. So uh, this is actually a piece of the comic that comes to real life. So Gia has a storage device called the mod capsule. It kind of is this weird pill-like box that has all these different chambers and things. And Gia has all these different magical things, devices that are stored in there. 
Um, and so the same idea is what happens um, when the students get one of these kits. Um, so they will build, in each kit, they will build a device, they will test how it functions, they'll conduct an experiment, and then the device is theirs to use however they want. And so the last page has of the booklets will have examples of what they can use that device to do in their own world. So it's not just do this very boring experiment and then check to see if the answer is correct. It's you do this experiment so you can learn how you can make these measurements and make decisions uh, and assessments on your own, and then go and do that on your own in the world, whatever interests you, or give it to your friend, right? The idea is that it doesn't just stay as a one-time practice, it becomes something that gets integrated into their life and hopefully that they talk about with their friends. Right, so this is um, the uh, static electric gauntlet, uh, which we see here. Uh, here's one example and we can um, use it later. I apologize for that box. Uh, we just modified it, but then we didn't modify the, that. That's an old version of the gauntlet. It fits to this. Anyway, you'll see it. Um, so again, this is uh, largely um, Chase's excellent work. Um, and so when we develop this, we basically select a neuroscience phenomenon. There's one of three things that we do with a kit. We can uh, expand our sensory experience, which we, is what we're doing with the static electric gauntlet. We can understand our sensory experience um, uh, by doing things that will change how our sensory system functions given certain um, uh, stimuli. Or we can um, make a model of our, our uh, structures. Um, and so we have examples, we're making prototypes of each of these three, and we'll distribute them to students to see how they react to each different type um, of experiment. Um, so for each one, each phenomenon, we basically go, okay, if students had to know three things to understand this phenomenon, what are those three things? And we make those the main teaching points, and we build scaffolding around that. So we introduce concept, quiz, introduce concept, quiz, introduce concept, quiz. Quiz doesn't actually look like a quiz, but you're assessing, right? <clears throat> Um, and then we build an experiment around those teaching points. Um, so you can only know, if you only know these things, three, these three things, what can you do? What kind of experiments can you conduct? Um, and then we build the background around that. So there's a booklet uh, that explains all of those three points uh, so that they can understand it and then walks them through the experiment. Um, and then finally, when we're working on actually coming up with our final product, we do iterative prototyping, which you can see here. So this is, and I'll show you. With the owl. Um, so this was like the first gauntlet and we made it adult sized <laughs> so you could actually put it on and test it so we could test it. Um, and then the final version is slightly different and it's smaller so it's more kid sized um, and it has a, a couple of different features on there. Um, another example is the uh, um, electrical circuit that we designed. So we ended up using a PCB to do this because we figured we wanted to have the kids build it themselves. But then we figured that's way too much to fit into an experiment. It's really hard to find ways to help kids safely um, build um, um, electrical circuits. So we just decided we'll make it for them. This is enough of a challenge on its own. They have to get the concept of what this thing is actually doing. <laughs> so let's leave it there, although it is a very simple circuit. Um, so we went through a couple of iterations of what the design would look like and finally um, landed on our final um, design here. All right, so here's um, pretty much the experimental structure and I'll walk, I'll walk you through this. So we have three treatment groups. One treatment group gets the comic book only. One treatment group gets the mod capsule only and one treatment group gets both. So we're going to be able to investigate how each of these components works independently and then what benefits we see when they come together. Um, so you can imagine there's a wealth of data within that on its own. Um, but with each one, I kind of talk about what we hope to see. So authentic research practice, playful exploration. Uh, we're learning about how we can do experiments and we're learning about how we can adapt that to our own goals. Um, and then this would hopefully in, uh, motivate um, research centered um, in interests. Uh, and then ultimately, of course, we want to see more students um, pursuing um, STEM skills because STEM skills have this broad application, especially, I mean, I don't have to tell you guys. Um, and then we also wanna see them uh, pursue STEM careers. And then with visual storytelling, we're hoping to see uh, identity representation. So not necessarily seeing hair texture or skin color, although that's there as well, but having these really complex and nuanced characters so that each reader can kind of find a feature like, oh, I'm kind of like Aisha, or oh yeah, I'm kind of like Gia, um, and relate to that particular character. 
Um, and then it's uh, everything is couched in a cult culturally relative context. Um, East Middlebrook uh, High School is a Title I school. They are kind of like the bad kids in the bad area, the wrong side of the track, so to speak. And so the team doesn't just go and solve problems and save the day. They have to do it in a way where they don't get cast as the villains by their peers, by their society. So it's kind of touching on things that a lot of students in these environments will likely encounter. Um, and in that just go, oh, I can still be a part of the whole push to save the planet, even though I'm in this place where everybody tells me I'm not gonna go anywhere, right? Um, and then together, um, we're hoping to see um, identity in research, identity uh, in STEM subjects, and having this personalized context. So it's seeing all of this kind of come together um, to basically help uh, boost these STEM attitudes in general. Um, and so um, I will be mailing, uh, we were hoping to have 75 um, participants total. This was for a, a grant that I didn't get, so the numbers are different. Um, so 25 uh, in each treatment group. Um, and then each um, tool or kit or, or comic is sent with a survey. Um, and each comic and kit has a quiz in it. And so they'll have to self-report how well they did on that quiz, along with answering a couple of questions that assesses their STEM ability beliefs, uh, their STEM identity, and their uh, STEM attitudes. And uh, so we're hoping uh, from these data that we'll collect from the surveys to develop models that look at how these students are learning and specifically looking at the effect of storytelling in this sense um, on STEM identity development, how project-based learning um, affects, affects uh, STEM ability beliefs and, as well as STEM identity. And then there's a couple of things that are just kind of, we wanna look at that are unique to Craniate, uh, which is um, how frequently do they share um, this experience? Do they talk about the comic with their friends? Do they talk about the kit with their friends? Um, and then what does that do? Has, how does, does that have any impact, measurable impact, measurable impact on uh, the three factors that I had mentioned before? Um, and then the impact of uh, frequency of exploration. So once they finish with the kit, they finish their experiment, how many times did they use that device uh, before they got tired of it? And how does that relate? Is that an indicator of anything? So we can see how this like persistence of play and curiosity has a role in STEM identity, um, STEM beliefs, and then STEM attitudes as well. Um, okay, so Craniate um, has a couple of, of cool things, uh, which makes the design a little bit tedious, but worth it. <laughs> um, uh, so first they have inclusive stories and experiments that any child can enjoy. So while we're targeting and really making sure that we're addressing disabled students, uh, LGBTQ students um, and other minoritized identities, we really want this to be something that any student, any child can pick up and go, oh, this is cool, I wanna read about this. Um, we have inclusive design. So in low-income households, um, access to parents is limited, uh, right? especially if you have uh, working parents. A lot of times children are home, uh, not necessarily alone, but not with a, a parent that can engage with them. Um, and so this is a no adult required experiment um, kit um, and content which I have not seen anywhere on the market. Everything is kind of designed to be done with your family, with your parents. Um, this is a little bit different. Um, it's visually focused content because we know that the reading um, disparities can be up to four years um, delayed. So we don't want this to be heavy on words, heavy on jargon, heavy on language. We want it to be heavy on visuals so that any student, um, ideally of any language, can understand uh, what's happening. Uh, language TBD. <laughs> That's a lot of work. <laughs> we're not, we're just getting off the ground, right? Um, we also make designs that try to minimize fine motor control. And here we're thinking about people, students with uh, varying physical abilities. Um, so we don't have anything that requires a lot of like needling or pointing or like really getting things into fine places um, in order for students that say have cerebral palsy and don't have fine con motor control, they can also participate in that. Uh, really led to this design of the gauntlet where you can stick your hand in and I don't have to grip. I just have to have my hand in there and I can still conduct the experiment. Um, uh, we have diverse visual representation and character design. Uh, so here's Hannah, um, who's the, the Lance, if you're familiar with the Party of Five trope. <laughs> She's like the second in command. Um, and here's Frankie, um, who I'll talk about in the end if we have a little bit of time. Um, 
And so we're showing how all these different students from different backgrounds get along and, and engage in, and deal with like cultural and language barriers. Um, all of our packages are eco-friendly. We build everything out of cardboard, recycled cardboard. <laughs> um, we do minimal waste. So uh, just to give you an example, this is the box, uh, we call it the Penta box, that um, the Mod Cat comes in and you can see the uh, actual gauntlet is in the package itself. So they pop this out. There's no extra packaging, right? We're using the thing that we're shipping it to to be the thing that they play with. Um, and then everything that you need is stored inside. Um, mostly paper products so we can easily recycle or at the very least it'll decompose. Um, minimal plastic use. <laughs> um, and then we'll add in a return when finished options. So with things like um, the uh, circuit board um, or the plastics, if they don't know how to get rid of it and they don't want it to end up in an ocean or a landfill, they could send it back to us and we can clean it or repurpose it and send it out to another student. Um, we also have, as I said before, scientifically authentic experiences. Um, so we have uh, plots that are informed by scientists and predictions by scientists. Um, we use uh, current tech, for example, in this um, first issue that we're working on, uh, we're featuring um, a robot that was developed here at CU Boulder. And at the back, we'll have like, oh, this robot is from here. And uh, so we'll tell the students about where these things are coming from. The idea is that we have Easter eggs of, of facts that are immersed in this fantastical world that makes students want to go, well, what about this is real? And really kind of work on blur blurring that line. Um, we have experiments that are designed by scientists, not just me, but we're taking kind of tried and true um, experiments that are kind of canonical, like for us, we're just like, oh yeah, we all know like this experiment, but for a lot of these students, they've never come across it before. Um, and so we're kind of creating this connection where let's say these students get the chance to meet a scientist, they can mention this experiment and likelihood, in all likelihood, the scientists might know about that experiment. So they can create these bonds. Um, we veer away from having a right answer. We don't want the students to check their answers to see they have things right, only in the background, not in the experiment. It's really building on this idea that they have to try and fail and figure it out on their own and take repeat measurements and make their own models and things like that. Um, and so they start to develop the ability to assert their own findings and then map it back to like what scientists do when they hear about things, right? When they learn that things are new. So that's Craniate. <laughs> are there questions about Craniate so far? <laughs> cool. I, yeah, yeah. How are you going? The disciplines, what do you mean? Um, like, uh, so you said you have 75 people at your college and everything like that. How, like, are you getting people to volunteer? Are you kind of like picking from certain places that you know will have like the students that can do it or? Yeah, uh, so first in, in all of the interviewing and polling that I've done so far, this is uh, very strongly desired. <laughs> people are really, really into the idea of these kits. Um, I have been working with Impact on Education, which is a nonprofit uh, that works with BVSD and SVSD, um, and they specifically work with uh, the disadvantaged students in that uh, in those school districts. Um, and I've also been working with folks who have been working with the foster program uh, and nonprofits that work with the foster program. Um, and so I can uh, also distribute to foster families and foster children as well. Um, and I just recently got in touch with someone who is uh, working to lower barriers for uh, Latinx students and there's somebody else, there's another group. Um, and then she also works with uh, unhoused youth. So those are my three main uh, connections for distribution. However, uh, there's basically a general form that I kind of send out whenever I run into parents and teachers. <laughs> so they can also opt in to, to participate in the study as well. So really trying not to just focus on the disadvantaged students. We kind of want to see a broad, uh, like as many demographics as we possibly can get in this pool um, so that we can see like how are, are there disparities in our sample pool and does this do anything to address those disparities? Um, I want to skip this last bit on research to market because I think it would be more fun for us to play with the things. Yes, sound good. <laughs> um, but I do want to close by saying uh, that wicked problems require broad solutions. Um, and so if you like this talk about wicked problems, I recommend you take my class, State of Technology in the Spring. Humble brag, hum humble plug. Um, 
So to solve wicked problems, we have to incorporate diverse solution domains, right? It can't just come from one place. One group can't solve wicked problems. It's a collective solution. Um, so we have to incorporate uh, the solutions from academic researchers, medical professionals, teachers, laborers, uh, labor unions, right? the people that work with the laborers, uh, stakeholder communities, the people that are directly affected. What are they doing? How do they talk? What are their solutions? How do they see the problem? How does it show up in their lives? We have to have all of that information and all of those minds working together to create a solution if we have any hope of tackling a wicked problem. And what I really like about this is that Academia alone cannot solve wicked problems. <laughs> we need each other. Right? And I think that's like a really beautiful thing uh, and a beautiful way to like think about how we can actually change the future for the better, right? We just need to talk to each other more and rely on each other more. Um, so I'm gonna skip all of this. Uh, and of course you're not going to show me what's on my screen. Um, and I will, if you want, I can go through the characters um, but I can also just talk about like what this is here and if you guys want to like play with it. I forgot a, a cloth. There might be one. No, I bet you this would work. Because you have to build up a charge. Ah. So this is a static electric detector. Um, and for those of you online, I will um, walk you through the um, characters as people are poking around. Um, and so to use it, we're going to turn it on. And you'll see this light, it has a green light and a blue light. And then you'll have to ground it. So this is going to detect a uh, difference in electric potential. And so you have to basically set it to like a baseline. And so you'll touch both wires. Um, so go orange, orange, white, orange. Um, and then you can take our wonderful plastic. And I want to see if this works. It should. <laughs> and just build up a charge on it by rubbing it. And then, unfortunately, I meant to bring tape so you can use this, but um, you can bring this device closer and then farther away and closer and see what color it turns. Um, and so taking, if you guys want, you're welcome to play with that. It's pretty hard to break it. <laughs> and if you break it, that's information, so don't feel bad. Um, so feel free to take that and play with it. And we'll come, try to come to a consensus on what color it turns. <laughs> when you move it to way, toward and away from the surface. And then for those of you, if you want to stick around online, I could talk about um, what uh, I will answer these questions and I will talk about what uh, you have to, don't forget to ground it between each time you try it. <laughs> and you might need to build up the charge after a while. Um, so I'll go through the characters uh, for those of you who want to stick around online um, or you're welcome to leave and I'll answer the questions as well. Um, so this is Gia. Um, they are a genderless triborg, which is different from a cyborg, um, which I'll, I'll talk about. So uh, Gia lives about 500 years in the future, um, has a very vague uh, birth. We haven't figured that out yet, um, but has extensive technical integrations, like has different devices that are kind of embedded in arms and um, heads and things like that. Um, ASL is a really common language in the future, and so when Gia first comes back, Gia is mostly signing. Gia has no pronouns also, um, uh, and has a nanobot um, serum uh, trial that, that both Gia and Malice were in to try to cure cancer. It was originally to stop a pandemic, but then we had to change that. <laughs> Um, a little too accurate. Um, and then uh, doesn't have chocolate in the future, so it comes back and like chocolate. loves chocolate, just oh, no. fiendishly in, in love with chocolate. Um, and then uh, their superpower is fast healing. Um, this is Aisha. It's one of the kids. Um, she's our reluctant leader. Uh, she's first generation Eritrean and Muslim, and she's the eldest of three. So she has a lot of responsibility, kind of a lot of a burden to bear. So doesn't want to be the leader of this like ragtag group of kids. Um, her parents are successful artists, and she kind of adopted that passion as well. Always dresses really well. Aisha is like to the nines all the time, um, <laughs> and is uh, so each student has a superpower and a steam power. So things that they're just interested in that help them solve problems and then their superpowers as well. So she has heightened vision. Um, 
but her steam power is art. So she likes to upcycle, does a lot of work with textiles and sewing and things like that. This is Frankie, probably our favorite character, although Gia is also our favorite character. We love them all, they're all great. Um, frankly, Frankie is 10, uh, Mexican-American. Uh, the family has been here for two generations. Uh, his parents are a nurse and a general contractor and um, Frankie's dad builds him a whole bunch of stuff. So he has like a super decked out bedroom. Um, uh, Frankie is trans, um, super proud about it, super open about it, kind of like come test me <laughs> like kind of attitude. Uh, his mom also has that kind of attitude as well. Um, he's born with spina bifida, so he's in a wheelchair. Uh, we're still kind of developing the degree of immobility that he has. There's kind of a lot that goes into that in terms of what we want to represent and how. Um, and then his superpowers are height and sound, which he starts to detect through vibrations through his wheelchair. So we talk about a lot about bone conductance and amplification of sound through solid objects. Um, and then his theme power is math and he makes a lot of geometric art. Um, yeah, and so this is the kit. Uh, so if you uh, want to use it, you have to go orange, white, orange and then rub the surface and then bring that device up to it. If it's easier, you could just take that battery pack off and just kind of hold it. You just pull it off, yeah. And then just kind of hold it and bring it up. Um, orange, white, orange? Orange, white, orange to ground it. And then you can bring the material up to oh, it. Oh, that's the see. problem. Because here it says orange, but it's white. Oh, well, I mean, white. I mean, just <laughs> touch the orange wire, touch the white wire, then touch the orange <laughs> wire. <laughs> I just poked it through the wrong <laughs> yeah cool and then i will um stop sharing my screen and answer any questions that people might have i saw a couple come up in the chat um so let's see here where is uh okay what are your end goals for when Craniate becomes a company? Would you pursue funding to make it accessible to use? Great question, Dover. Um, so that was actually uh, incorporated in the design. Um, and so we have been working to keep the cost of each kit to $10 or less. Um, and that way it lets us uh, produce our kits at competitive market prices, so about $30, $35 per kit. And for each purchase of a kit or a subscription, you actually buy a second subscription. So kind of like Tom's Shoes, except we amass how many um, kind of free kits we get. And then once we hit a certain number, we send them off to a, a Title I district or uh, libraries in a low income area or to uh, foster um, and uh, housing um, uh, services. So that way it's kind of built into the business model. That's really cool. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> question. Have you applied for SBIR? Or? I have not applied for SBIR. This sounds like very much SBIR. So it's got this research component plus this bring to market component. That would okay. Be perfect. Yeah, I'll definitely check that out. That's valuable. Thank you. Yeah. I have a question. Yeah. Because uh, you mentioned the target on clients are usually 13 children. Yeah. However, they are really influenced by the family, mm -hmm. but how the family who really appreciate STM, STEAM all day, and understand STEAM, yeah. they are from higher yes. society status, so how do you deal with the problem? Yeah, so part of it is in the, the design of the product itself, so having a lot of students or imagery of, uh, of like minoritized students, like melanated uh, characters and things like that, is one way to kind of just kind of push through that. Um, and the other is through the way that we're kind of doing the research and how we're talking to it. So it's gonna get distributed through the schools first. Um, and then through the business model, when people are purchasing one, we're gonna send it to school districts. So it's getting around this idea or the, the tendency that like middle-class affluent families are gonna be the ones that purchase it. And then they're gonna be the ones that know about it. Um, it also becomes something that gets distributed to those uh, more diverse areas as well. Um, and then the hope is that they talk about it and then we start to lean on these tendencies of communication in those in those communities where things happen more by word of mouth than by, you know, let me send you an email about it or something like that. Um, and so hopefully kind of relying on these organic ways of communication to get around that. Yeah. Um, 
Uh, love the focus on visual storytelling to pull students in and create opportunity for them to talk about this amongst their friends. Would you consider an online social media presence uh, for creating it? Would there be any kind of effects of interest in, uh, research interest there? Great question. I'm so glad you asked that. No. <laughs> A hard and intentional decision to not have social media presence. So all of our social media content and internet content is designed for the parents, the, the customers, but not in, intended for the kids. So yes, children are going to follow it. Yes, there's going to be some interest, but it's really not going to be designed for them. Uh, because of the overwhelming damaging impacts on social media, we just don't want it to be uh, the way that we're communicating. And then also coming back to these disparities with how, or differences, not disparities, but differences in how uh, different communities will com will talk to each other and communicate and tell people about different um, events that are happening within the community. Uh, we don't really want to rely on social media because that's going to swing the bias back toward what I call mainstream, uh, which are the, the demographics that are most served. I, I really love that, um, especially because I, I feel like that must have been a hard decision um, or, yeah. or an easy one, but <laughs> yeah. I love that. Yeah, definitely a hard decision and one that I'm not quite ever sure of. <laughs> would you have like, would you have the website still? Yeah, so there would be a website. Uh, uh -huh. There's a couple of places like if they want to return um, their kits, they can or if they need to get an extra survey or if they would rather fill the survey out online, we would do want to have that option available to them. But the whole idea is to like get away from screens, get away from uh, kind of the, the stereotypical things that bombard uh, kids and give them something that doesn't have, we don't have to worry about the tech gap. We don't have to worry about uh, like um, uh, distributions between populations and, and their tendencies. We have something that's kind of uniform uh, for all, all users. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned that it's designed to be independent of having parent help and I really love that. Do you control for that in your study? Like do you ask them how much parental inter uh, intervention have you had or, or you know, whatever that may look like? Yeah, so their final survey, uh, so their exit survey, will where they were gathering um, like their age, their gender, their identity, all that stuff. Uh, we're also going to ask how often did your parents help you, um, or if your parents are filling out the survey for you, which is also really important, especially when it comes to things like gender identity, where might not want to say or might not like support that. Um, so we definitely want to know if we have reliable data in that way. So. And also the the frequency of use after. I, so I noticed that was another data point, like how much uh, parents are intervening and encouraging them. Because I would imagine that's different across the different social economics. Yeah, so that, so the sharing and the discussion is going to come from interviewing, uh, which is only going to happen with a subset of the um, uh, participants. I think it's like 10%, uh, 5 to 10% something in there. Um, uh, and so that, yeah, it's, it's a little bit, it's going to be a little bit difficult to like extrapolate that, but, um, do, like that's where, so it's going to come about a little bit more organically where we can see, like, um, ask them, are you going to, you know, how likely would you tell your friends about this? Um, and then see in how they are exploring, get just information of like, okay, well, they gave it to their dad or they gave it to their parents, like try this out or, uh, and start to get, uh, inferences there. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I've been, uh, I do want to put up my thank you slide. So I've been working uh, really closely with uh, Melissa Broughton, who's been helping uh, develop the surveys and uh, my interview process. Um, and then uh, Brandon Grossman is her uh, grad student who works with um, uh, foster families. Um, and then Aaron Furtek and Bill Penuel are also, and if you don't know who they are, definitely go find out who they are. They're amazing rock stars. Um, uh, really, really big uh, names in STEM education um, who just kind of been pointing me just like, no, talk about that instead. <laughs> like, um, yeah, I think that's, that's all the things. So thank you guys so much. I really appreciate it. Sorry for going over a little bit. Yeah. Is this a prop? Uh, that's for another, um, another kit. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually, yeah, it's a motor mount. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Well, thank you all for coming. Thank you so much. Sorry. Well, it was good. Cool. Is this
available? Like, for example, if someone wants to buy one kit? Um, no, we're not yet. We're, not really. we're still, so we're hoping to just start distributing them next month. Um, okay. and so we are looking for participants. So if you do know someone, um, that would be interested. Uh, I was thinking about like my, I have a nephew and a niece, yeah, <laughs> but a nephew who is a dad would do that.